Good afternoon. My name is Tatiana DeGrosa, and I'm a co-director of the Start Engaging Parents of Students with Disabilities in Schools project at SPAN Parent Advocacy Network. I would like to welcome you to today's webinar, New Jersey Tiered System of Support, a Framework for Successful School Reopening, Recovery, and Beyond. This is part one, supporting all students as, as schools reopen of the three-part webinar. Now, uh, let's talk a little bit about SPAN. Since 1987, families in New Jersey and beyond have made SPAN their first stop for support and resources. Today, SPAN's po uh, projects, uh, programs for, pa for parents of children from um, birth to age 23 and for uh, 26, pardon, and for, for women of childbearing age have expanded from a kitchen table to over 20 national, regional, and local programs funded by government agencies foundations, and fee-for-service contracts. These programs cover education, uh, health and mental health, human services, child care, and child welfare. And our mission is to empower and support families and inform and involve professionals interested in the healthy development and education of children and youth. Our foremost commitment is to children and families with the greatest need due to disability, or special health and mental health needs, poverty, discrimination based on race, ethnicity, gender, language, immigrant or homeless status, involvement in the child welfare or juvenile justice systems, geographic location, or other special circumstances. In order to achieve uh, this mission, SPAN's core programs help families, professionals, and policymakers know the rights of families and their children, access resources and information, secure appropriate services, navigate multiple systems that serve children and families, keep children healthy and in school, prepare for life after high school, connect with other parents who understand, be catalysts to improve services for children and families, start and run parent groups, become effective partners in improving schools, and advocate for other children and families. Please visit our website for additional information. This webinar is presented to you by the STARS EPSD project. Um, <clears throat> this project is the partnership between the New Jersey Department of Education, Office of Special Education Programs, and SPAN Parent Advocacy Network. Um, our project offers programs and services that support the engagement of families to improve outcomes for students, including developing and sustaining special education parent advisory and support groups in communities and school districts. Through workshops, regional meetings, and parent leadership development activities, we help parents and parent leaders to become informed and active participants in their child's education partner with educators in improving educational programs for students with disabilities, particularly in the area of inclusion. Start and strengthen special education parent advisory or parent support groups, and increase effective family engagement to improve special education programs, policy, and practices in school districts and communities. Allow me to introduce some of the members of the Start EPSD team uh, that are here today. All of us serve as parent group specialists. In addition, Debbie Esposito and I are co-directing the project. Debbie is also our literacy project coordinator. And to connect with the rest of our team, please visit our webpage. And I will um, drop the link in into the questions uh, pane in just a few seconds. Uh, Debbie? Thanks, Tatiana. So welcome, everyone, to the first session, first session in our three-part series, Supporting All Students as Schools Reopen. Before we get started, we wanted to briefly review our goals for this webinar. So during this webinar, we will review the New Jersey Tiered Systems of Supports framework, discuss the essential components as they relate to reopening of schools, understand how NJTSS can facilitate our roadmap to reopening, and learn what parents can do. So this is our first opportunity for you to let us know what you think. We want to do a little reflection. How would you describe your child's experience? 
with remote learning. You know, we've suddenly unexpectedly shifted to 12 weeks of remote learning. This experience has affected all of us in different ways. So let's take a moment and reflect and discuss. Um, please put your comments in the question box. Again, how would you describe your child's experience with remote learning? Okay, yes, comments are um, coming in. I'm just gonna read them out loud. Mm -hmm. Someone sharing that they found the experience um, frustrating and uh, their kids were uh, worried, uh, uh, anxious, or and overwhelmed at times. Um, another person sharing that they felt uh, that there was no consistency. Mm. Uh, here's one that who found this remote learning experience rewarding and their children felt uh, safe at home and we're hopeful uh, that it will pass soon and they will be able to return to school. And somebody says they were very appreciative. Um, Great. So you can keep um, putting your, your replies in the comment box and we'll, we'll, re we'll refer back to them at sure. various times during the presentation. So moving on, so let's, what do we know about NJTSS? We're gonna do a real quick refresher. So we do know, as a refresher that NJTSS is a framework that many schools use to, to provide individualized support to struggling students. It focuses on the whole child. NJTSS supports academic growth and achievement, but it also provides support and interventions that address many other areas, including behavior, social and emotional needs, and chronic absenteeism. It's a comprehensive system that screens all students and provides interventions that can be intensified if needed. It's a proactive rather than a wait to fail system. There are three tiers to NJTSS. Tier one delivers evidence-based core instruction delivered with fidelity to all students. Tier two provides targeted small group interventions in addition to core instruction. And tier three is intensive interventions customized to student needs. This webinar will focus on the supports found at the universal or tier one level. If you'd like a more detailed explanation of New Jersey tiered system of supports, you can always refer back to one of our earlier webinars, which are available, like I said, on the, the start section of the SPAN website, but also um, you can find them on the SPAN YouTube channel. So there are nine essential components to NJTSS, um, effective district and school leadership, family and community engagement, positive school culture and climate, high quality learning environments, curricula and instructional practices, universal screening, database decision making, collaborative problem solving teams, progress monitoring, staff professional and staff professional development. The development of these components within the school districts allow the framework to be implemented effectively and as intended. Together, their purpose is to promote a systemic or systematic consistent approach to prevention, intervention, and enrichment. The framework allows the classroom teacher to address the different abilities of each student. As we talk about the return to school, it's important to understand that these components can also provide the necessary tools for creating a roadmap to re reopening schools for your child. For the purpose of today's webinar, we will be focusing on tier one universal supports for all students. So let's take a closer look at tier one. Um, like we said, there's, tier one uh, includes a high quality learning environment, curriculum and, and instructional practices, planning for differences in student ability and learning styles, multiple ways for teachers to teach and for students to show what they've learned. And as we said, and I can't stress this enough, tier one supports, universal supports are provided to all students. And as you, if you look at the, at the graphic on the, on the screen, most students will fit into tier one instruction. So let's review. NJTSS is a framework that many schools use to provide individualized supports to, struggle, to struggling students. There are nine essential components to NJTSS and tier one is universal supports for all children. 
Um, let's take a moment to answer any questions that you might have about what we've covered so far. You can put any questions or comments in the question pane. While you type in, um, typing in your questions in the questions box, I wanted to report out some additional um, comments to our earlier question that came in. Um, one of the parents, Poonam, uh, she was um, shared that she was able to get her son um, to focus on a lot more academics and other areas that she needed to work on during the remote learning. Um, that's that's wonderful. Um, that is Poonam. great. And a lot of parents actually shared with us that they became more aware um, and in the know about what their children actually learn in and how to help them as well. Another parent shared that it was remote learning came came very suddenly, and she was worried. Uh, as a parent, she was worried of her um, son's um, social issues, um, and that's also uh, Marina being a concern for me. And you parents um, sharing with us, they felt as though their children were so socially distanced or isolated from each other, and that uh, was um, a concern of theirs as well. Um, Destiny sharing that it was hard because she's a parent of a toddler and uh, she missed school a lot. Little kids, um, uh, you know, uh, going back to a, a preschool or kindergarten who may not exactly understand what's happening and wanted to see their friends and uh, do their routines and rituals that they used to in their classrooms with their teachers. Yes. Uh, we have one question. Uh, see, one question, Debbie. It just... Um, how do we know if our school district uses NJTSS? Do most districts use it? It's an excellent question. That is a very good question, and we are going to address that a little bit later on. But I'm just going to, um, just the quick answer, the short answer is you, you should ask. You should ask your school leaders. You should ask um, your superintendent, your building principal. Ask them if they're using the NJTSS framework. But we'll we'll go back to that later in the um, presentation. But thank you, and that was a really good question. Um, so now we're going to take a look at a closer look at how these nine essential components can help us plan for school reopening. Stephanie, thanks, Debbie. Hi, everybody. How are you? Hope all is well. So we talk a lot about universal screening. Students with students will have varying degrees of success with remote learning and will be returning at different levels. Universal screening will be key in assessing early on where the gaps exist and in implementing interventions to address them. Screening should be done within the first few weeks of the new school year to identify gaps and assess what remediation or and support, if any, is needed. The New Jersey Department of Education acknowledges the importance of the timeline for screening, and they recently published considerations for universal screening. The considerations reflect the challenges that remote learning has created in doing valid assessments. Technology, for example, has proven to be a barrier if a child doesn't have access to a computer or internet. So the NJDOE has suggested um, alternatives to traditional screening, including independent work samples and quizzes. Depending on what issues arise, relevant stakeholders, including parents and community, come together to address it when necessary. The active cooperative involvement of diverse school staff and community resources creatively addressing the academic, behavioral, and health needs of the students is key in identifying students' needs. Districts should have a group, team, or coalition formed to review the situation and create different blueprints of the supports needed in September for our children. When we think of our children's needs upon the return to school, we have to think about their social, their social emotional, academic, and behavioral needs. This time at home may challenge districts to review the way that information, curriculum, the content is presented to our children. They may need a different approach in order to assess a child's knowledge and skills. It's important to make sure the strategies reduce barriers to learning while acclimating them back into a school setting. Next is collaborating with families and stakeholders. The reopening roadmap will only be as successful as the time, effort, 
energy, and creativity put into it. It will be critical that the district leverage all of their resources, including parents and community stakeholders, into the process. Collaborative problem-solving teams will need to be created to review data and obtain input. Teachers will know where gaps are by looking at data from the universal screeners. They will be able to access data to show parents where the gaps are and to involve parents in addressing these gaps at home. Parents will understand expectations and better be able to support their, their students again. Positive school climate and culture emphasizes the proactive and preventive measures aligned to a student's sense of physical and emotional safety. Some things to consider. Will students feel safe returning to school? What CDC protocols will be in place? Returning children will have experienced a lot of trauma, job loss, illness, et cetera. What types of screening is in place for social and emotional behavior issues? Is the school using um, PBIS to address social and emotional behavior challenges? It's important that there's frequent communication, use of supportive behaviors, ongoing recognition, and opportunities for student, parent, and staff input including surveys, discussions, input meetings, which can be done either in person or virtually. When remote learning started, the family dynamic was immediately impacted. Parents found themselves in the role of learning coach. They served as a guide, supporter, and motivator to stimulate learning. Some days were easier than others, but that input is invaluable in being part of the planning process. Effective district and school leadership is essential in the implementation of NJTSS. There should be a clear vision and plan developed collaboratively and with input by many. It is important that the district is flexible in their approach and understanding that there are many moving parts to ensuring a smooth reopening. Our children have been through a global pandemic and had to shift to remote learning. Similarly, school staff also had to acclimate. How is the district providing the necessary support to their teams? If we go remote again, how have the teachers been prepared? How will the district address those who may need additional training on various platforms? If you ask any parent, educator, or child, they would probably say they learned something new about themselves in remote learning. And I'm sure the majority would probably go back and do something differently if they had the chance. So as we look to September, we need to focus on those lessons learned and figure out how to create a roadmap that addresses those issues. Progress monitoring of students and the situation as a whole will be critical in the reopening. How will we know what is working and what isn't working? Will districts demonstrate the flexibility and the skill set to proactively address any issues before they become problems? Database decision making collaborative problem solving, and high quality learning will work hand in hand to monitor the progress and change course if necessary. So let's review. We know that any loss of time of being in school can result in regression. But what we are dealing with in this particular situation is academic as well as social emotional challenges that ourselves as parents and our children have never experienced. While some students thrived during remote learning, there were certainly students who struggled and some who quite frankly did not participate at all. Under NJTSS, all students are routinely screened and supports are provided. In the current context, alternative tools would be able to assess early on what skills need strengthening and could provide the necessary interventions and supports without waiting for students to become frustrated and fall further behind. These supports can be followed by progress monitoring to check how effective they are and to make adjustments if necessary. So we're going to take a moment and answer any questions or if you want to um, have something or if you have something you want to add to the conversation or any questions, we'll take a moment now. Um, yes, Stephanie, we have um, <clears throat> one comment here. Uh, one of the parents sharing that um, with regards to uh, remote learning um, her son did really well uh, but it took side by side working with him side by side through all of the assignments for him to do mm -hmm. well 
and how important do you think to for the parent for this parent to share this information with uh, the IEP team with the teachers I think it's extremely important I think it's you need to go and explain that that was a level of support that you had to provide I can completely relate I have I have two I have two small children and I had one who she worked very independently and I didn't have to sit side by side with her but my other but my son I had to provide he you know he has special needs and I had to I really had to provide that level of support but I feel that it made it, it it will make you and I think the way you go back to your district is to say what did you see it was so eye-opening um having that front that front row seat to to see how your child was learning and so I think that feedback is essential and maybe there's a level of support there that when you that when our children when your child does return to um, a school setting they may need maybe some additional support or maybe what was the type of support that you were providing um, you know, was it, um, you know, maybe breaking down the information? Was it um, doing different techniques? Uh, techniques. I'm sure as parents, we started to learn the different techniques we needed to incorporate. Um, so perhaps those are some of the, the, the feedback that you can relay. And it'll be very important. You're part of the team. So it's important that you give that information back um, to the team, um, especially as we talk about the transition. I see no other questions. You will have another opportunity later on. Uh, so please type your questions into the questions box and we will address them shortly. Great. Thank okay. you. Okay, moving All right. on. All right. So the sudden and massive interruption of instruction has been very challenging for everyone. And we've all been left with no playbook on how schools should respond. And there is the further possibility that even after schools reconvene, Future instructional lockdowns um, may be ordered due to flare-ups of the virus, or even, or perhaps schools may be reopening as a hybrid model. You know, they may be all remote. They may be returning everyone returning into school, or maybe the hybrid, a combination of some some days you're going into school, some days you're at home. It could be a whole bunch of different things we don't know yet. But what is that going to look like, and how will that impact your child? Let's begin to create a roadmap. So although we don't know what exactly that's going to look like, this roadmap is going to really help us to prepare and to get our questions and think about it. So, so when we think about, the first thing to look at to think about is identifying the gaps. Some have done well under remote learning, which is why it's so important to have um, a plan in place to assess where students are when we resume school and to be ready to intervene when necessary. When schools reconvene, this group of delayed learners will need timely remediation and support to catch up on this missed instruction. These three months, as we just mentioned before, during our question portion, um, has given parents a front row seat to their child's learning. In a recent poll, roughly seven out of 10 parents said that they plan to get a better understanding of what their children are expected to learn in September. They will find more time to communicate with their children about daily assignments, and seek a better understanding of where their child stands academically. Another 64% of parents said that they plan to speak with their teacher about what they noticed about their children's schoolwork during school closures. So let's look further at some of the gaps. The COVID-19 pandemic has highlighted the widening digital divide. So when you think about it, how is your district reaching students and families who don't have internet? Do students have access to technology equipment and the, and, the, and the internet to engage in distance learning? Roughly one in five American adults are smartphone only users. So they have no access to home broadband services or laptops. And low income Americans were particularly disadvantaged. For some students, they were unable to access enrichment opportunities, such as virtual field trips. To address the gap, students without access to internet have been, have been forced to roam their hometowns looking for open Wi-Fi networks. Facing a remote learning crisis, some school districts paid for their students' internet to make remote learning possible. NJTSS is a framework that meets the needs of all students with universal core curriculum and instruction, designed and implemented to meet the needs of all students. And all the, those students include your English language learners, your bilingual learners, advanced learners, and students with disabilities. Differentiation of behavior and academic instruction begins in that first tier, in tier one, in your universal tier, and continues across the different tiers. Differentiation requires teachers 
to recognize every student's varying levels of readiness, interests, background knowledge, language, culture, and learning preferences. When teachers differentiate, they respond and proactively plan for differing abilities in the same classroom in tier one. When we shifted from school buildings to remote learning, our children were forced to physically distance from one another. And the social emotional connection to their friends and fellow students was greatly impacted. Our children suddenly became physically isolated from their peers. For some students, the sudden school closure occurred alongside other potentially tra traumatic events, including family income and job losses, health crises, and a high overall level of disruption. For families focused on survival during the shutdown period, concerns about housing, food, healthcare, and jobs may have taken priority over student learning. Wraparound services help schools address social and non-academic barriers to student learning. They are student and family supports integrated with and often delivered directly within schools. So examples of wraparound services, they're broad and they include anything from mental health services, um, behavioral health, nutrition, wellness, um, family and parent targeted services for our ELL students, and social work and family crisis response. Wraparound services have the potential to help families, children, and teachers alike. The theory behind the wraparound services suggests that students whose health and wellness needs are attended to, they will be healthier, they will be more focused, and better and uh, better able to learn. And similarly, families engaged with schools and supportive services have an increased capacity to support child learning and health. And then finally, for schools, having additional systems for confronting social challenges that impede learning will allow teachers and administrators to focus on instruction. So now we're going to have a little chat. So I want you to take a moment and reflect um, and go, you can go into the question box to answer, to, to answer this question. What do you think needs to be in place for your child's academic and social emotional needs to be addressed when we, when we return to school? Mm -hmm. Thank you, Stephanie. I was having just um, some very active chat um, uh, while you were talking, and I wanted to share some of the feedback that I've, uh, we've been receiving so far. So, uh, Aaron here, it's it's really uh, great because it um, just touches on those academic and social emotional gaps that you were just um, presenting on and describing. Uh, this one parent is sharing that you know, uh, while she appreciates remote learning and the opportunity to continue education online, she's not a big fan of just um, online learning or screen learning. She yeah. would like to see um, more of uh, hands-on or written assignments for the child to do prior to returning to school. Um, and her other concern um, is social emotional. Um, yeah. Her, her child is scared and worried to go back to school, uh, mm -hmm. to go anywhere. So these are the concerns that need to be addressed before, um, before the, the child can return to school. And we hear yeah. that a lot. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And it's, and it's completely normal. I mean, as we talked about, the, our children, I mean, they're so resilient. You know, the fact that they just had to I, I get emotional thinking that, you know, my, our children left a building one day and that was it. You know, it's like, it's like just time stopped right there and they had to then retreat to um, a remote setting and just get used to a whole different way of learning. And, um, you know, it really has been so challenging and, and really for everyone, for the families, for teachers, for everyone, because there is, there has not been a playbook and there is, we're learning sort of as we go along, and it and it and it is it is very scary, and I I can understand how how our children you know and our children I, it breaks my heart for them, to you know that I'm sure everyone is scared and worried, but you Another, know uh, in a little bit in a few minutes um, Debbie is going to to present some some good strategies um, as well. 
I just wanted to mention that another um, parent chimed in to say that um, uh, for her, she was struggling to explain to her child why uh, her child can't go back to school or play uh, with her friends. And I suggested um, to um, take a look at their, some of the resources that we have available on SPAN website around um, COVID-19, specifically some materials parents and teachers can use to talk to their students and their teachers about um, COVID-19, global pandemic, um, grief and loss, but also those resources include um, social stories for little mm -hmm. ones or different ages and different languages to help them process um, this um, this uncertainty. We have another question. Um, Cheryl is asking that her child is clearly needs additional supports and benefited greatly from a one-on-one or side-by-side -side support that she has um, provided him with during this um, the extended school closure. She has um, spoken with her um, teachers or her school and she has received pushback from the school regarding this. And she was wondering if we have any suggestions on how to present it to ensure they understand. So one of the suggestions that I have is to give specific examples. I think if you just, you know, just say to a district, if you just say to your district, if they, it, let's just be real. When you say one-to-one -one support, usually a district that, you know, the hairs on the back of their neck stands up, you know, because they're like, okay, well, that's an additional person. So um, I think the best way to approach it is with very specific examples of um, the level and the type of support and the effect of the support, how you, what was successful in the level of support that you provided. So um, like, I think that's kind of a way to start the conversation because that could actually be maybe the, and, and you may find out like, oh, we can provide something like that. So that's a way to engage and start to open the conversation. If you just hit them from the, from the gate with like a one-to-one, -one, you're going to probably get pushback, but you have to present the, and, and, you know, we always say as a, as we always tell parents to, you know, when they're advocating for their children to always ask the, uh, your school district to present data, like, oh, show me some data, some information to support why you feel that way. So I'm going to say that to the parent as well. You prevent, you present your data as well. You've been home as a learning coach for three months as mentoring, supporting, and really helping your child. What data have you compiled? And I'm not saying you have to take a number like on this day, this happened. I'm saying cumulatively, a cumulative of, of, of support that you've provided with examples. Great. Thank you, Stephanie. Great suggestion there. Yeah, I appreciate that. Um, and we, and the person who answered that um, says, thank you, it did help. Um, okay. another, uh, another comment that we received that actually echoes a couple of other um, uh, comments that people are put in is that one of their biggest concern if the students return back in September is how the children will adjust to having to wear masks and stay six feet apart from each other, from other kids, uh, having no recess uh, will be very difficult for them not to get close to um, their peers and parents are here are wondering how this will be enforced and the emotional impact of, um, of all that this will have on the natural behavior um, and the, how this behavior might be viewed as being policed all day. And I think it's a perfect segue of what right. um, is going to touch on yeah. the next section of the webinar. So I would just uh, say that we can go ahead and jump yeah. right into having this conversation. Great, Thanks, great. I agree. Thank you, Tatiana. So that was all great input and very timely. So how can we put this input and your feedback into the context of um, our roadmap and going back to school? What can families do? So one person asked earlier on how to know if your school district um, is using the NJTSS framework. And I told, and as I said, um, I well, one of the resources that we provided wasn't is and it's in your um, your 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 resources for download um, is an MTSS family school and community checklist. So you can refer to that and see if your school is using um, these um, 
this framework or these techniques, but the best thing to do is to um, ask, ask your school principal, ask your, you know, at a board meeting, you can address the superintendent or your school board and ask them, are we uh, an M NJTSS district? And if not, we also provided another um, handout or resource that has MTSS talking points. So NJTSS is New Jersey's um, adaptation of an MTSS framework. So some of the documents do say MTSS, but we in New Jersey refer to it as NJTSS. And um, there are talking points that you can use when speaking with administrators or school personnel to, to advocate for using an MTSS framework or NJTSS. Um, ask your school district leader if they're using the framework. You might be told that your, your school is using something called RTI or PBIS. These are other uh, multi-tiered systems that, that, um, let, that use a multi-tiered level of supports. But um, I would say and we also provided a, a handout that that discusses the difference between MTSS, PBIS, and RTI, which are all um, tiered support systems. Um, most of all, it's important to keep in contact with your district. Um, as, as we return, um, remember that the switch to remote learning threw everyone a curveball, including our school districts and including our teachers. So um, make sure we keep in touch and we're informed. And I'll, and I'll talk a little bit more about that as we move forward. And finally, let's get back to the components. We've discussed that there are nine essential components, but the first three that I mentioned are what we consider the foundational components. That is, they form the foundation of the New Jersey tiered system that supports effective and they are effective school and district leadership. And as you, if you look at the graphic, you can see that th these are the ones that surround, um, that are surrounding the, um, the, the tiers. So they're effective school district leadership, um, positive school culture and climate, and family and community engagement. So let's look closer at each one of these. So right now, most school leaders have begun some, begun some form of planning for reopening. You know, and it is our school leaders, our school leadership, who are responsible for creating teams with representation from administration, staff, students, families, and community partners, so that a clear district reopening plan can be developed collaboratively and all voices are heard. So let me repeat that. So a lot of these questions that we've been asking here about, you know, how are, how are students gonna be expected to wear masks or how they're going to handle that you know how are they going to be able to reconnect with each other socially you know in in with concerns about uh social or physical distancing all those questions are good questions and you should be part of that team you know parents need to be part of that team as we uh create these these reopening committees so another question that we should at should be asking is what is what is the opportunities for parents to be on these teams, you know, you know, when do they meet? Who's in charge of them? And how can I be a part of it? Planning should be uh, flexible and take into consideration several scenarios. Remember, uh, Stephanie mentioned earlier. At this point, we don't know what's going to happen in September. We could be back to school, but we could be back to remote learning or some combination of both. Flexibility in scheduling of all students and of staff, because remember, a lot of our staff are parents too. So it's going to be, you know, so flexible scheduling for them may be key as well. You know, as well, professional development. Teachers and other school personnel need to be prepared for whatever back to school will look like. The next essential component is positive school culture and climate, aligned to which aligns to a student's sense of physical and emotional well-being. Remember that from the beginning. That is, students need to feel safe when re when they're returning to school, and parents need to feel secure in sending them. So any reopening plan needs to include information regarding building cleaning and maintenance, application of CDC guidelines with, with respect to wearing of uh, PPE, personal protective uh, equipment, um, social distancing and interaction. 
Students have been apart from each, from their peers for a long time. School, so schools need to provide opportunities for students to reconnect with peers and with their teachers, but in a manner that is appropriate for the current situation and in line with the guidance that we're receiving. So this can include social emotional learning curriculums, as well as school and district wide positive behavior interventions and supports for returning students. So parents might be asking, how will you respond if or when my child shows signs of anxiety? What will be the discipline policy regarding the wearing of masks or adhering to other guidelines? How will the district screen for students who may have experienced trauma during the school closings? And how will school facilitate interaction in a way that respects social distancing? So family and community engagement. Um, now is the time to start engaging with your school district. Um, by creating committees, connecting with parent groups, offering feedback on surveys. I mean, there are a lot of them that are going around and they're all important. Um, find out if, if planning has begun and who's in charge in your district. And like I said earlier, um, under family and community engagement is so important to find out what are the opportunities for you to be involved in the planning. Once schools do reopen, identify strategies and resources to accommodate cultural and linguistic differences and link families and staff and students to appropriate services and service providers and community partners, um, like appropriate after, before and after school um, care and um, other community partners. Use of multiple means of culturally responsive ongoing communication um, include review of district and school level performance and progress data. Um, so how are we communicating? We talked a little bit earlier about universal, um, I'm sorry, about um, universal screening. So how are we communicating the results of the screening to parents? How are we letting parents know um, what we're finding? Um, scheduling of intervention planning meetings to facilitate meaningful parent participation and review of student progress. So how are parents being brought, you know, and, and all of this family engagement, we're always thinking about how are parents being brought into the loop? So when we're planning, when we're assessing the children, when we're getting that data back, how are we being brought into the loop? Um, like as, as Stephanie said earlier, um, now that parents have been home with their children, they see them as learners, they understand a little bit better what kind of learners they are, they understand a little bit better what schools are expecting of them, and, and most importantly, they understand a little bit more the role of parent coach or, or, or learning coach. And so that's a role that we don't need to give up just because schools may be reopening. We are still our children's learning coaches. You know, our job is still to motivate them. Our job is still to help them prioritize and organize, you know, when necessary. So we still have that job and we still, you know, want to interact with schools and partner with our schools. So some other questions you might ask is what, how do you see the role of the teacher and the parent in the learning process? You know, what is our school day going to look like for students next year in terms of student schedules, including bus schedules, class size, class changes, lunch, after school activities and clubs, you know, especially for high schoolers that are heavily involved in sports, high schoolers and middle schoolers. Um, so how is that going to look next year? You know, if we have to go back to remote learning, maybe part time, you know, is my child going to be provided with an electronic device or a hotspot for remote learning? Uh, what ongoing training and support will be provided to parents and care caregivers and and other family members to effectively support learning of home learning for their kids? What supports will be provided to non English speaking families? How is the district planning to communicate with families? that don't speak English. So what, is structure, what instructional resources will be pro provided to families of children to facilitate learning at home? For example, textbooks, lesson plans, and other school supplies. So these are just some questions. But I'd like to know, um, what questions do you still have? And what other questions do you think that parents should be asking? 
You can take a few minutes and, and put some answers in the question box again. Tatiana, do we have any comments or questions in the questions pane? Um, yes, excellent questions that you um, you uh, shared, Debbie, that parents could ask uh, district leaders. Um, and uh, Marina is chiming in, and, uh, and she says that I she feels like she needs support and training to continue helping her child right. the best way she Absolutely. can. Right. It, whether it is we're going to um, continue with remote learning or going back to school or have a hybrid model of for education moving forward, that the parents also need training and professional development on how to be able to support the work that the teachers do uh, and what they can do at home. And, and uh, can I just say real quick to that too, and I, and I think that's a really excellent comment, but I want to I want to say that that doesn't have to just apply in remote learning. You know, that's part of what, what, what parent groups need to be advocating for, whether it's your CPAG or your PTO. If your kids are bringing home work and you don't feel like you are equipped to support them in doing that work, then 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 professional development or parent training is one of the things that we need to advocate for. I mean, I know in my own school district, our FAST committee, our family, you know, our teacher union has um, a FAST community, which is families and schools together. And one of the things they used to always do is provide uh, training around when math curriculum, when our math curriculum changed, you know, we always hear families when the parents talking about the new math and how they don't understand what their kids are doing. Our schools should be providing um, training around how we can support our, our learners at home. And they so that's do things like parent right. universities exactly. or other and yeah, all of those exactly. things are, are not, I mean, this is not um, something that is out of the realm of possibility. Schools can do that kind of thing. So if you feel like you need training or parent training to support your children during remote learning, then you should ask for it. But also don't forget, even when we go back to school, if you feel like if, if parent, you know, then your, your parent groups, join with your parent groups and say, this is something that we need. We really need to be able to support our learners at home. Right. And to add to what Debbie just said, with, um, which was fantastic, I wanted to also add that um, it's going what's the important part with that training is the timing. So I think that's the other piece is making sure that when you reach out to your district and say, listen, if we're going to continue or whatever professional development. But but in this case, we're talking about remote learning to make sure that that, that, that training that you need is happening. Um, as quickly as possible, as soon as possible as they can, right. not waiting until November, um, you know, the earlier, the better. The other thing I wanted to add to that, too, is the focusing on the mask and the social distancing. That's all feedback that you should also be sent, maybe even putting together in an email, you know, writing up an email with your concerns and sending it to every board of ed member and to your superintendent. Um, the every county has a county um, a county supervisor of special education. Um, if, if you have a child with you know um, with an IEP or with special education, you can also include that person as well. But these are the people and these are the connections that you need to make to to um, convey your concerns because those are absolutely um, valid concerns to have. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. We Absolutely. have a lot of um, terrific questions, um, additional questions to come in if uh, I may um, jump in and maybe um, share with you, with the rest of you. Sure. Um, so another great question might be, um, how can schools integrate their parent portals with the child's learning platforms? Um, and I know that you um, just mentioned um, parent universities and other digital um, systems and platforms that schools are using that sometimes it is uh, too much to, for parents to navigate and they don't um, necessarily overlap or marry easily. So really integrating them and sticking with one um, platform that works for families and students and schools uh, without sending um, parents to all of those different resources. That, um, it's very possible that the parent portal may not be may not be married to the learning platform. So that could be um, something that you again address address with you know with your district that this is something that could you know be more effective and efficient because mm -hmm. I think it's also important that parent that there's an efficient factor here when we're trying when we're doing any kind of remote learning. Um, so so but but you know when I think about a, a parent portal, I 
don't know what the capabilities are um, to be integrated with learning platform, but that's something, that's a great question to ask. Your that is, Especially yes, absolutely. In, light, in light that um, what we, with the discussion that we had earlier regarding universal screening and uh, 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 sharing data with parents on an ongoing basis, reviewing that together. Um, so just having, um, uh, a platform or means to uh, share the data electronically um, in real time is very important. And actually, it brings me to the next comment. Um, the question that Cheryl is uh, found challenging is for her to be able to determine which assigned assignments were grad graded which way and when they were due. Um, it, it seems that there was mismatch going mm -hmm. on and um, and you know, she as a as a parent uh, feels as though training should be provided on how to help manage your child's education. Um, I agree, and and, uh, and I have to go. Hmm? Yeah, I just wanted to say, and uh, and this goes back to <clears throat> not only parent professional development or parent training, but also teacher training. I found with my own son, um, in our district, we use Google Classroom. That a lot of the teachers didn't know how to understand how to to properly use the Google platform, Google Google Classroom. Mm -hmm. And they were posting things in a way that it was difficult for him to understand as well. You know, when the due dates were, what the grades were. So a lot of what you're saying is not, it's not always the parents and, and the and the students. A lot of times, you know, as we, as Stephanie, and, and as we mentioned earlier, this was thrust upon um, teachers suddenly. Um, a lot of times, you know, I know in my own school, my own district, they had planned to take, um, I think that Tuesday when we shut down, they had planned to close early on Wednesday and take the rest of the week doing professional development. And that never happened. You know, right. it was like overnight we came home on, on, I think, Monday and then Tuesday we were done. And right. so there was no turnaround time. And so um, a lot of this, and, you know, if this, if the teachers weren't already proficient in using that platform, then they were just kind of thrust into it suddenly. And a lot of them needed more professional development. So we need to make sure that our teachers are being properly trained in using this platform too, because it, it had a really significant effect on my son um, in terms yeah. of how. how and yeah, yeah and, I, and I wanted to add to that that um, the what and then I'm not sure if you're in a large district or a small district, but I also feel I also find being in a large district, there was also an inconsistency around, you know, absolutely like each teacher was sort of operating in their own. It was very siloed and, and each teacher was doing their own thing. Um, one of the things that I think is good and, and and I also think this is a nice strategy in building your your collaboration with your with your child's um, teachers, it's to kind of get feedback from them. And also say to, you know, you can even say, listen, I'm going to be putting together some information that I'd like to share with the Board of Ed and with our superintendent about how remote learning was and what my concerns are. And, you know, what was your feedback? Because I feel like sometimes teachers don't, may not always have an avenue to express their their own experience with it. And so sometimes it's nice to build that collaboration with the parent um, to get that feedback from teachers to say, you know, the teacher may say, you know, what would have really helped if we had this, this, and this. And that could be part of feedback that you provide to the district. Because it, it, you know, I always look at it as when you're providing feedback, you want to also provide a solution. And that's also part of getting that feedback when you're speaking even with the staff to get the information that you could share and say, listen, this is this was the issue, but here are some strategies or here are some solutions. Here are some ideas that perhaps could could help. Um, and I think that's a nice way to to build that bridge with your district as well. Thank you. Yeah, I just I wanted agree. to. Um, yes, um, to share that we are receiving a lot of um, thank yous and uh, people are sharing that absolutely they will be reaching out to be part of the planning team. Uh, they will look into the training uh, opportunities and uh, uh, be advocating better. Um, they're thanking us for uh, validating their frustration and giving them ideas on how to address them. We're so isolated to begin with and uh, it just the the shift was just tremendous for all of us. And and you're not we myself and Debbie and Tatiana, we we had our own frustration. So, yeah, you know, it, it, this was this was all, everyone had, you know, frustration with all of this to a certain extent, you know, absolutely. but the, the thing is now, what do we do about it? How do we channel the frustration into action? And 
and to, like as I said earlier in the work in our webinar, to we've all learned at least one lesson from from the past three months. How can we turn that into um, an opportunity for improvement going forward? And that's important. Absolutely. Thanks, Stephanie. Um, so we have a few minutes, but I just wanted to know this is the end of our content. You're welcome to continue. Um, with your questions, but I did want to thank, you know, we want to be mindful of people's time. So um, I would like to thank you all for your time and your and your input. And uh, so SPAN is, at SPAN, we're always trying to bring information and resources to families and professionals who, who are concerned about um, achievement and well-being of children. So I want you to please take a minute and give us feedback um, at the end of the webinar um, an evaluation will populate automatically. And we do use that information when we're creating our resources and when we're creating our events. So um, we wanna know what you want, what information you need and want from us and, um, and what kind of discussions we wanna be having with our parent advisory groups and, and, and about what advocacy topics. So again, if you think of a question after this webinar, please reach out to us at the, at, I am, at um, the contact information that's available on the slide. Um, and like I said, that concludes our content, but um, we still have a few minutes. So if you if you have any other questions or if, Tatiana, if you wanna share any of the comments or questions that are, are available. Uh, lots of thank yous uh, for the content. Um, a lot of appreciation expressed and gratitude. Uh, thank you for everything. Uh, you're welcome. That means a lot to us, so thank you for saying yeah. that. Uh, I dropped in their questions box again, the link to our, our webpage where you will find uh, valuable and wealth of resources and various topics. Uh, find, um, uh, look to, to see if you have a special education parent advisory group or CPAD in your districts and how to connect them, how to uh, reach out to every one of us and other team members for um, for assistance with starting one or facilitating one um, in your district. We have, um, again, uh, lots of resources around um, inclusion of students with disabilities in schools and communities, uh, more information on New Jersey tier system of supports and literacy, um, uh, uh, literacy uh, uh, achievement. Home, yes. Yes. Uh, you are welcome, Destiny. Have so, a great afternoon, everybody. Have a great day, everybody. Thank you. Take care. Enjoy. Bye-bye.